Netflix has been in a lot of hot water over the past year. From putting a stop to password sharing, incorporating ad-based content, and most importantly, all their recent cancellations. There's too many to even count, but it felt like every other day I was coming onto Twitter to see the news of either a new series being cancelled in the middle of production, or an existing show having the plug pulled on it before managing to reach its full potential. It's a real shame. Think about all your favourite shows. Which season of that would you consider your most loved? 99% of the time, I'd have to assume it's something past the first couple. The more time folks are allowed to work on a show, the more they can truly hone in on their craft and perfect it. But here are all these series that'll just never be able to reach that potential. It's kind of sad when you think about it. Something else I always see when a show gets cancelled, however, is a statement somewhere along the lines of, This cartoon gets cancelled, but Big Mouth is getting another season? Oh yeah, Big Mouth is like, like widely acclaimed, I forgot about that. Me and my big mouth. <coughs> big mouth. That's the show. That's the show. Released in 2017, Big Mouth shows the adventures of a group of kids as they face the horrors of puberty, with it being personified by a giant hormone monster who follows the children around, giving them advice and helping them explore these new feelings and emotions. And despite what the internet might want you to believe, it is a big hit. You see, when these adult animated comedies come out with ugly art styles, and clearly just created because some celebrity thought making a cartoon would be easy, they usually only last a season or two. But every now and then, one manages to slip through the cracks. F is for Family by Bill Burr is wonderful in my opinion, and it thankfully got a full five seasons with a definitive conclusion. But Big Mouth is a strange case, because if you look at most places online, you'll see nothing but pure hatred for the series. Yet, on Rotten Tomatoes, it sits at a 100% rating with critical acclaim across the board. It's currently on its sixth season with much more to come. How does that happen? I remember when the show came out, I thought it looked awful. Watched the first four episodes and then gave up on it. I had no real opinion on it, other than what I saw so many folks saying about it online. That it was the spawn of the devil and needed to be cancelled immediately. Which had me confused, as all these people constantly get angry about shows being taken off the air, and all the people working on it being out of a job, yet Big Mouth is apparently so terrible that the same argument apparently doesn't apply to it. Surely it can't be that bad, right? Well, that's mainly because a lot of animation fans are hypocrites and only get mad at this when it shows they like and cheer when it's something they dislike. You know, they're the folks who say you shouldn't criticize something because people worked hard on it yet love to crap on Big Mouth any chance they can get. But anyways, that's what I want to figure out today. Because over the past week, I sat down and watched through all 61 episodes of Big Mouth to try and come to a conclusion on the question that has plagued a generation. Is Big Mouth really that bad? The answer may shock you. But first, you know what you should shove in your big mouth? All the tasty products find over at Factor. This video is sponsored by Factor. It's a new year, and you know what that means? New goals. And Factor is here to help you achieve every one of them. Save time and have the energy you need to tackle everything on your to-do list with Factor's ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. Having your source of income come from a site as unpredictable and malleable as YouTube, I can't afford not to spend every second of my day working on content. So luckily, Factor allows me to save time by skipping a trip to the grocery store, prepping and cleaning up, with their fresh, never-frozen meals that are ready in just two minutes. Finally! No, I can never leave. Traveling to America, I wasn't used to having all these food apps right at my fingertips, so Factor's been a great way to make sure I stick to a routine with healthy options for food. So head to Factor75.com today, or click the link below and use code LSMARK60 to get 60% off your first Factor box. That's Factor75.com in the description, and use code LSMARK60 to get 60% off your first box. And thanks to Factor for sponsoring this video. Big Mouth is, in quite literal terms, a coming-of-age show, which if you were unaware is my absolute favourite genre. If your thing involves coming-of-age in some way, I'm immediately intrigued. Almost Famous, Submarine, Superbad, all some of my most beloved films, so I was really curious if Big Mouth at the very least makes for a good coming-of-age story. It doesn't. Created by Nick Kroll, best known for being the voice of the fat pig in Sing, great sign right off the bat. It stars his self-insert Nick and his best friend Andrew as they begin reaching puberty. Also, there's a girl called Jessie who they talk to, and also this wacky guy who hangs around called Jay. They imply that the four of them are good friends, but we almost never see them do regular stuff friends do, so the best I can say is that they're all acquaintances. In the Big Mouth universe, when a kid reaches a certain age, they're visited by the hormone monster if they're a boy, or the hormone monstress if they're a girl, their whole purpose being to, in theory, guide them through all the strange feelings and things that come with puberty. When you hear that idea, you're like, what the hell? That's like, it's like perfect. 
Coming of age is all about characters losing their innocence in a way, so having the literal personification of that loss and innocence is genius. How could they possibly? I'm pregnant. What? <laughs> nice. I mean, how would that even be possible? Guys, you had a slam dunk. What happened here? The biggest issue that I think plagues Big Mouth, at least for season one, we'll get to the rest when we get there, but it's that there's such clear disregard for any sort of rules, wanting to go for a style that's much more akin to Family Guy where outlandish things can just happen. Whether it be supernatural like ghosts, Nick having one in his attic that he talks to, or sci-fi like them going inside the internet, or stupid like, 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 like the pillow thing again. There are no set rules in place for what can and cannot happen, and while I can see the advantages to that sort of humor, being how many more opportunities for wacky jokes it leads to, I can't help but find it completely unnecessary in what's advertised to be a relatable, grounded story. When the series was coming out, the writers and creators kept talking about how they were pulling experiences from their actual childhoods and showing the gross parts of puberty in all their glory, but then you watch this show and it's just a bunch of nonsense. The biggest defender to this is the hormone monster himself, Mori. Again, he's the personification of the kid's emotions, so you think that he'd be exclusive to Andrew, his kid. Like, <laughs> There's not actually a giant monster following this kid around all the time. He's like, he's like a metaphor, you know? You know? But no, it's like, it's like a business? It's his job to follow around all these kids and help them deal with their emotions, but at the same time, they have influence over their actions, like there are times where Andrew blames Mori for how he behaves. And even then, I could accept that, but we're expected to believe that he's also the hormone monster for the other kids, too? Do you mean the hormone monster? Yeah, Mori. He's the f***ing man. It honestly reminded me of the Fairly Odd Parents more than anything, but with a much dumber setup. Like, okay, imagine the Fairly Odd Parents, but Cosmo and Wanda are every kid's fairy godparents at the same time, and you're never meant to question how they balance all this. Even then, they established that there are other hormone monsters. Like, there's this old one who eventually becomes a Nyx by the end of the season, but he's the only other one we see. So are there more we haven't seen, or, or what's up? Wouldn't it make sense for every kid to have their own unique one specifically catered to them? I don't know. Also, I have to take back what I said about them personifying their puberty like this being genius, because, as it turns out, the hormone monster is actually an alien, because a big blue guy came down from the sky millions of years ago and f***ed the earth. Hi! Why would you overcomplicate such a simple idea? It should have been easy! So yeah, no, they're really there. Which, goddamn, creates a whole cavalcade of other problems, such as... Nobody ever decides to call out that Andrew has a giant monster following him around, except for one time when it's used as nothing more than a throwaway joke. Hi, you're looking at me. How tall are you? There's a monster next to you. Hey, what's up, Caleb? I feel like that comment should be made a lot more frequently in this world, especially because it seems like nobody else has their hormone monsters following them around, or else we'd see them too, I guess. But not even, because when it's convenient to the plot, everyone just tunes him out and acts like he's not even there. Like there's this moment in season one where Nick and Andrew start fighting in the school hallway, but this is because the hormone monster told him to get mad. So if they can see Mori, then wouldn't they understand that this was a result of him egging Andrew on? They pick and choose for whatever helps their forced drama at that point in time. At the end of season one, Andrew gets arrested by the police because they think he killed someone. It's very dumb, I promise. But then his parents get pissed at him for making up a story of a monster putting a hole through their drywall wall. But like, wouldn't his parents have remembered having their own hormone monster when they were kids? How about time? Does it stop when the kids are talking to their hormone monster? The first episode sees Andrew arguing with him about whether or not to j*** off during a sleepover at Nick's, saying he doesn't want to wake him up. But you're speaking so loudly, couldn't he hear this? Just have him be a metaphor and nothing else, it's that simple. It seems like this idea was come up with under the assumption it would operate under these specific rules, but the further it got into development, the more leeway they gave themselves for what they could get away with for the sake of comedy. And this may seem minor and like I'm just bringing in a bunch of nitpicks for the sake of complaint but if you watched the show, you have to know what I mean by this. It is such a specific idea they're going for, that when they actively go out of their way to do stuff that doesn't make sense, it takes you out of it and leaves you utterly confused. And the more this happens, the less immersed I am in your world. And of course, the less immersed I am, then the less likely I am to be along for the ride and laugh at the absurdity. What doesn't help is that it completely feels it showing you how puberty is affecting these characters. Episode 1 just straight up jumps into Andrew talking to his hormone monster, but part of a story like this is seeing how puberty is changing the characters, yet we get next to no time to establish and get to know these guys before they start going through these different stages in their life. How about the series starts with an exaggerated view on adolescence to show how big of a threat puberty is going to be treated? Have a scene of Andrew and his friends doing some kids stuff and then out of nowhere the hormone monster shows up, imposing on his life and making it clear that he's here to stay, Andrew realizing by the end that things are going to be different forever from this point on. 
You know what does that well, actually? The goddamn intro! That last shot of the intro is grit that should have been an actual scene in the show. Go away. You are not real. You're just some hormone monster my brain created. I mean, yeah, no, that's just as impactful of an introduction. What definitely doesn't help is that none of these kids sound like kids. The whole gimmick is that Andrew is going through puberty, yet our main character Nick isn't. He's underdeveloped. Yet this is what Andrew sounds like? I mean, I'm over it, missies, and her mom was just about to make some decaf yerba mate. And this is what Nick sounds like. Andrew's got a date, so I'm staying at home. And I guess I'm going to a high school party? This is prevalent with a majority of the characters, and it's yet another thing that just takes you out of it. But I think what really gets me more than anything is that despite having all the pieces here for a truly amazing coming-of-age story, they drop the ball with just about everything. Each season of Big Mouth explores a different aspect of growing up, whether it be sexually or facing your anxieties or whatever, which is a good idea. So I can delve more into specifics that relate to those things when we get there, but to start, I think it's at least important to lay the groundwork for what I believe makes a good coming of age story, and our Big Mouth absolutely feels at all of them. One. The characters have to want something. It can be anything to be seen as older, sex, acceptance. They need to have some goal in mind. Your average hero's journey, if you will. But in Big Mouth, all the characters seem to just be going through the motions. Andrew seems like he's trying to fight puberty, but he doesn't really do anything about it. It's more so just used for jokes about his unwillingness to go along with the hormone monster. Nick wants to be seen as older, but despite being the main character, he feels like he barely has any presence in the series. Andrew comes off way more like the protagonist. There are a few episodes in here that truly show that aspect of him well. I think the one where his sister is having a house party illustrates this the best, but even then there's not really much of a conclusion he ends up at, which leads into the next point. Two. Your characters need to mature in some way. They need to start and end the episode in a different place. This one, they at least try to achieve. The show does this thing I honestly really love, where each episode builds into the next, where they all have their own standalone stories, but where each character ends in the previous one is where they start in the new one, which is used to tell even more stories. I love that! For example, in that house party episode, Andrew and his girlfriend Missy get together and she pressures him into making art, and so when the next one starts, their parents find out about this and split them up, leading into a story about them needing to continue their love in secret. The big issue here is that while I love the idea, in execution they mostly fumble when it comes to the characters feeling like they're changing in a natural way. Episode 6 sees Andrew realize that Nick is embarrassed by him, because Andrew suddenly acts super embarrassing out of nowhere in front of these cool kids. And it's like the writers know they have to have some sort of turnaround by the end, and so Nick just randomly decides to apologize at some point. Again, the pieces are there, but the way they connect is just missing. Even for simple stuff, it feels like they're just hitting beats because they know they can derive conflict from it. Episode 7 shows Andrew trying to control his urges by not off, which greatly upsets the hormone monster. And so during his and Missy's first kiss, he blows up and causes an earthquake, which ruins it, which, which he can do, I guess. And then the next scene just has Mori come in saying that he'll refrain from anything sexual from this point on. This is just for the purpose of having that moment at the end where he realizes that he can't fight those urges and screws up massively, giving Andrew an erection, which, again, he can do for some reason. I thought he was a separate entity. But there was no scene of the hormone monster wanting to make that change. He just suddenly had this change of heart off screen. Why? Because the writers knew they needed to bring up some new conflict. This is a problem present throughout the entire series. That episode where Missy and Andrew continue their love in secret shows her randomly, out of nowhere, start to feel overwhelmed by everything and eventually break things off by the end. Yet there has been nothing present to show her attitude switching, especially because she was the one being pushy about the relationship. Things just… things just happen! 3. A Loss of Innocence a key part of any good coming-of-age story that goes well with maturing is the characters at some point having clear separation between how they were and their new mindset. For example, Rick and Morty has an excellent part where Morty wants to use science to create a love potion for his crush to fall in love with him, a very childlike idea. This then backfires, causing the destruction of the world, and so he and Rick have to abandon it, find another universe where they're dead, bury their bodies, and take their place. It's then followed by this wonderful shot of Morty just walking around his house. Everything else is the exact same, but his view on the world has not changed, which is reflected then in his more cynical attitude as the series follows. Big Mouth really has nothing like No moment is really treated with any kind of severity because they're more obsessed with telling wacky lol random jokes. Ah! You know who's funny? 
the Big Bang Theory. What further ruins this aspect is that the writers clearly had no restraint when it came to differentiating writing for kids versus adults. See, when you write for a kid character, especially if you want to make them come off as realistic and relatable, you gotta almost put yourself in the mindset of a child. Like, okay, a child would not randomly start yelling and tell their mother that they're the patriarchy. None of these guys ever seem innocent at all, so there's really nothing to lose. They're basically just mini adults from the get-go. Yeah. We know what we're talking about. It's nice to talk like men. Yeah. I crave emotional intimacy oh because my parents have a no touch policy with me, so I don't <sighs> really feel oh, like I I get it. All. They're missing that moment, that big moment where the kids start to see the world for what it truly is, marking a transition in their mental state, where we see them truly grow up. But instead of having any kind of subtlety to it, they just throw the entire message of the show in your face. There's a particularly bad moment in the second to last episode where all the characters break into song, although less break into song and more like they're going about their usual conflicts than a character announces they're gonna sing a song and suddenly everyone just joins in at once, dancing in unison like some creepy cult-like ritual. In the classic piece, Life is an Effed Up Mess, everyone gets a line that just explains the message of what's currently going on with them. Yeah, that screams confidence in your writing. Children grow up and abandon you to die broken and alone. There's a shocking amount of musical numbers littered throughout the season, ranging from surprisingly decent like this one where these ghosts sing about being gay to, yeah, that one. And alone. But for the most part, the biggest problem that faces this season is that the writing is so obsessed with silly jokes that it never feels like there's any real conflict. Again, things are just happening. Which truly sucks, because there are good things about this season. I did not loathe my time watching it at all. There are a bunch of aspects I enjoyed a lot. For one, I think for a season meant to give you an idea of what the show is going to be like, they cover a bunch of good topics that relate to this theme. Andrew wondering if he might be gay. Nick screwing up being in a relationship with Jesse and trying to act like he was the one who broke up with her. There are good ideas in here, and I can only imagine they would have been handled infinitely better in the hands of someone who was more willing to focus on these rather than stupid hormone monster gags. Because believe you me, the humor is bad. Really bad. I can get something out of a show like Family Guy, which creates the expectation early on that the rules can be bent whenever they see fit if it makes for a funnier joke. But when you have a show with as grounded and focused of a concept as Big Mouth, the last thing I want are epic meta jokes about the fact that I am indeed watching a cartoon at the moment. With the new Velma show coming out, I'm honestly very happy to see more people come out and collectively agree that meta humor is getting super tired and not nearly as biting as it was 10 years ago. When a show used to be meta, it was so few and far between that it caught you off guard. You weren't expecting it, and because every artist working on these cartoons didn't have an easy way of contacting them like we do now with social media, it was kind of surprising and nice in a way to see that employees on these cartoons were just like, just like real people who were almost trying to talk to us through the show. But ever since you got compilations of these fourth wall jokes blowing up on YouTube and such, it comes off more like people want to capitalize on this popularity and cram in as many winks and nods to the audience as possible, just so they can eventually make a goddamn Twitter post about it. It's not funny anymore, it's just cheap and comes off like you're so afraid of telling a sincere story that you've got to raise your eyebrow to the viewer every five seconds so they don't think you're too invested in your own world and the story you're trying to tell. Is it not ah, please tell me they put a Walgreens in this Netflix. What do you guys get to watch next? You want to hang out? And when it's not doing that, it's just taking the worst of Family Guy, where the gag it just comes from over-explaining stuff in place of a joke, hoping that you'll eventually find it funny. Okay, I've held off on it for too long, but I gotta say it. This show looks terrible. A pattern you can easily notice is that when you get cartoons made by celebrities, they usually look awful. I love F is for Family, but it is one of the worst looking shows I have ever watched. Right below that one, though, is definitely Big Mouth. I appreciate the fact that they're trying for a somewhat different style than what we're used to in these adult comedies, but it seems like the new things they do are all for the worse. Like giving the characters these ginormous f***ing lips that protrude off their face, they all look like fish and it is so unappealing it's gross to even look at. Then there's the strange realistic eyes, well, okay, realistic compared to everything else, but they've got so much unnecessary detail that it looks like a bad hyper-realistic creepypasta. The animation itself, though, is fine. I was surprised to watch it and see there's actually quite a bit of frame by frame in there, which you can tell by the line width changing sometimes, but it's really the art style of bringing everything back. Also, the backgrounds are super inconsistent, it really bothers me. Sometimes they have colored outlines, sometimes they have super harsh shadows, sometimes they look right out of Family Guy, and then when they cut to establishing shots of the school it looks like this. One thing I see a lot of people take issue with is what they actually decide to animate and show you on screen. Hell, it only takes five minutes into the first episode before you see one of their dicks. It took The Simpsons a movie before they went that far. It's not even the worst of it. I think the strangest part would have to be when they fully animate and show a face on the girl Jessica's... you know? 
and they hold on shots of it for an uncomfortably long time. Like a show about a bunch of kids ma- Isn't that basically just like ch movie? Holy shit, I hope not. You're not helping your case, big mouth. Now, I don't inherently think that a show starring teenagers can't focus on full topics. You know, that's been done successfully time and time again. Look at the in-betweeners, our sex education. There's countless examples. And to say that shouldn't be explored at all is a very reactionary place to take such an argument, especially considering that such a large part of growing up and coming of age is the sexual aspect. But, and that's a big but, Big Mouth drops the ball by going too far into it. Like, because it's a cartoon, they really do get away with showing everything, and it's really not necessary. That's all I'm gonna say on this uncomfortable matter. Overall, season one of Big Mouth didn't leave me absolutely hating it, but more so annoyed at how badly they butchered what was such a brilliant idea for a cartoon. There is so much missed potential here, with solid concepts yet pretty bad execution. Mainly from the show not knowing whether or not they want to tell a more grounded story or funny Family Guy gags. It is just the first season, however. Those tend to be rough, with the writers and showrunners still getting a grasp on what exactly it is they want to do. So let's check out the second season to see if they begin to refine any of these ideas. Season 2 of Big Mouth focuses on s- oh, God damn it! And mostly as a joke! It was Logan Paul level hilarious! Jay, look at you! Let me get this out of the way because I really do not want to talk about it any longer. But if any of the stuff they showed in season 1 made you uncomfortable, then please, for the love of God, do not watch season 2. It will not change your mind because they get away with showing much worse. Saying this, Somehow, on the actual writing side of things, this season is miles better than the first, although it definitely isn't without its issues. Oh, yeah, it's called society, you privileged white cis hetero male! I think what really helps is that build around one single theme instead of just doing whatever comes to mind. The humor takes you out of it less, and the fact that episodes barely have an ending isn't as big of a problem as the events of them will 9 times out of 10 pay off later. Again, the theme for this season is sex and shame. Dude, can I just say this is the worst possible topic that I could have done after YouTube integrates this new swearing stuff, I swear to god. Anyways, each of the characters have their own arcs in relation to this, each doing a solid job at standing apart from one another. Andrews is building off the previous season where he was turning into a pervert, the line he's willing to cross getting more and more depraved with each episode. Jesse and Missy are feeling self-conscious about their bodies upon seeing this other girl in her class maturing faster than them. Meanwhile, Jesse is also dealing with her parents being on the verge of a divorce and acting out in different ways because of this. Like an episode where she and Nick smoked the weeds for the first time. All while Nick is dealing with his new hormone monsters, trying to get with the girl I mentioned before and subsequently messing things up with her. Jay is there too. They don't drop the pillow stuff. Seeing that pillow stuff continue literally throughout the rest of the season made me realize this is probably something that average Big Mouth enjoyers thought was hilarious, which further made me realize that a lot of the stuff I find confusing about this show, such as the complete lack of rules, which is not improved here, trust me, with the kids now at certain points being able to see each other's hormone monsters, is probably something that a lot of folks never even consider when watching. I think it's important to acknowledge that many people choose not to think about media critically like that, which is completely fine, but I don't know, I I think it's at least worth addressing that a lot of the stuff I complain about here are probably things that people love about the series. Can we go inside? I know that people can't see me, but I feel kind of exposed. There's a monster next to you. Hey, what's up, Caleb? Case in point, all the funny meta humor, which is only ramped up with season two and is getting increasingly more obnoxious. I really don't know how much longer they can keep this up for. You got five fingers, don't you? Well, actually, I have four, but that's pretty standard animation. <laughs> What's even worse is that, even in the last season, there are so many jokes here about Netflix and how amazing it is. Like, they desperately want to sell you on the streaming service, but if you're watching the show, then that means you already have the streaming service. Gina, streaming on Netflix has never been easier. This Netflix, it sounds expensive. <laughs> You'd think so, but it's not, Gina. You know, unless you were to pirate it. But, Andrew? What? Slender Man is. Okay, that last one wasn't meta, but I wanted to show it anyway. All the arcs are nothing stellar, but I do like the way it all culminates at the end, particularly with this new character, the Sheem Wizard. He's basically just the embodiment of one Sheem, but again, he, like, does it for everyone. I love how he haunts Andrew, judging him for every bad choice he makes and making sure he doesn't forget about them, making him anxious and paranoid. And the two-parter where all the kids are locked in the gym for the night, only to realize they're all haunted by the same being is great. Could have done without the ending, but an idea is there. They even come back to it in the final episode where we see him explain that to have Sheem is a good thing, without Sheem wants there to stop you from doing anything you want. 
The Shea Wizard is probably the best that have handled a subject in the series, especially his introduction. Wish we could have got one for the hormone monster too! Point is, there are concepts in Season 2 that are way more fleshed out compared to the last, and some of them actually aren't too bad. I also really like Nick's new hormone monster. Okay, wait, let me rephrase. In concept, I really like Nick's new hormone monster, because in practice... He, he's annoying as fuck. He's new to the job and inexperienced, and so that reflects Nick's choices in how he handles the relationship with the girl he likes. After he makes out with her, the monster encourages him to tell everyone because they're so excited and eager, which predictably backfires later on. Huh. It's funny, it's almost like these are greatly improved when each kid has their own specific hormone monster that caters to them. Huh. Still though, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying this season is amazing or anything. It's got quite a bunch of issues that for sure bog it down. Let's start with the minor complaints and work our way up to the more glaring problems. First of all, that episode where Nick and Jesse smoke is super lame. I have yet to see a cartoon that accurately conveys what that does to you. N not that I would know, um... So, so yeah, you do not see things jumping out at you or start to have your limbs bent and contort, fusing with others. You don't see wacky magical rainbows and flying dragons, you're mostly just chilled out and sit around eating whatever the hell is in front of you. Yeah, not that I would know. There's this episode early on that's all about abortions, and it is so lame. They spend the first couple minutes talking about how badass and brave they are for tackling such an issue, looking at each other like, Whoa-oh, folks are gonna be mad at this one. Then we see a couple unrelated segments where they are extremely on the nose about what the points they're trying to make are, literally having all their dumb characters talk about how abortions are bad, so the smart characters can come in and list all these epic abortion facts. But it's mostly abortions. Oh, common misconception, Jay. Abortions make up only a tiny percentage of what they do. Yeah, they also do breast exam. Educational for sure. I'm positive many 12-year-olds learned a lot of stuff watching it, but uh, I'm watching this for entertainment, not for a lecture. By far the worst aspect, however, is what they end up doing with Jesse by the end of the season. Because it is a genuinely interesting idea, and they do nothing with it. See, they very naturally build up to Jesse feeling more and more fed up with everything throughout the season. To where by the final episode, we see her run away from going to a therapist with her mum, and going into a portal with Nick and Andrew to the world where the hormone monsters come from. I... I don't... Like, why is this needed here? It's very obvious that this is just a backdoor pilot, like, Whoa, look at all these quirky characters we could explore if this were its own show. I mean, I gotta give it to him, it worked. But here we see that Jesse's hormone monster is being fired and replaced by the depression kitty, meaning Jesse is now depressed. If we ignore how they establish in this very episode how without a hormone monster you won't go through puberty, so, so you know, how's that gonna work for her? Also ignoring that the kitty puts her in a depression ward where she's gonna spend the rest of her life, which doesn't make sense as a shocker, that's not what happens when you're depressed. But it's evident they're using this whole thing as a metaphor. You know, the cat is laying on top of her, and therefore she feels like she can't even get out of bed. Very obvious analogy they're making here. But the way they end up defeating her depression by the end is just... Just by distracting it with a laser pointer, and suddenly she's not depressed anymore. Any of you guys watching this ever felt a little down? Boy, do I have the thing for you. I think what they were going for here is that your friends can help your depression, like letting them help you, but it was not handled well. Especially considering the implication here is that it fixes your depression, which, sure, it can help, but definitely not fix. I wouldn't know, though. I don't have any friends. Just feels like it wasn't thought through. I think this for sure should have been the ending of the season to be explored further in Season 3. Instead, the cliffhanger we get is seeing that now the hormone monstress is Nyx. However, that works. Why the hell am I even concerned about the rules at this point? Another slight plus I can give it is that the animation is a little better than last time. Backgrounds are somewhat more consistent, and there's a greater variety of the shots. You can definitely see the added budget. I just, again, wish they chose not to animate certain things. Still, though, all things considered, Big Mouth Season 2 is a major step up from the first on just about every front. It's nothing amazing, and I think that the first being so abysmal means that even the most minor improvements seem like a godsend, but I can see more of an effort being put in here, at least in the writing department. I could see a kid watching this and actually finding it relatable, whether it be from the body positivity or the shame stuff. Maybe we were too harsh on Big Mouth. Sure, it's got one bad season, but if the rest continue to improve upon the formula like this one, then I really don't know what I'm going to be coming out of this video thinking. Talk about bup.
Pepsi. If that makes you uncomfortable, buckle up, y'all. Considering how well it worked out last time, I was shocked to see that for the most part, Big Mouth Season 3 abandons having a central theme, opting for a format much more in line with Season 1, which now leads me to believe that Season 2 was a complete fluke. They start with a 45 minute Valentine's Day special, which I'm almost positive isn't even supposed to be part of the season, more so just a middle episode between season 1 and 2, but it honestly does a solid job of connecting both of them together, building off the season 2 finale, and leading it into where these characters will go in season 3, mainly with Jess starting to believe that he's bisexual, wanting to screw both male and female pillows. I still can't believe they haven't dropped that by nine. But we also see Nick dealing with his new hormone monstrous, finding out that he's our first boy and shows signs of going through female puberty, however the hell that works. They try to shove in way too many characters to this special, but it gets to the point of being so bloated and there's so much going on that it winds up balancing everything out. I also really like that the second act low point has the full version of the intro theme playing. I want to reiterate this from earlier, but the intro to Big Mouth is quite literally the best thing about it. I absolutely love that final shot. I wish the actual show was that good with its imagery. The way she's dressed, she could be a boy, or a girl, or a minion from the Despicable Me franchise. What? Sadly, I don't think the next bunch of episodes does nearly as good a job at following this up, mainly due to the plots they choose. We have a plethora of bizarre, creepy, and not all that interesting choices here, such as Nick getting a smartphone which can talk to him and makes him addicted to it, clearly going for that whole kids these days are glued to their technology theme. They for some reason thought that riveting arc needed a whole two episodes dedicated to it, then we have one where Nick and Andrew are going to Florida to visit Andrew's family where he falls in love with his cousin and makes out with her. And then the next one continues this with an A, B, and C story that could not be more tone deaf from one another. We have Jesse trying to learn how to make it with many more up close shots of her you know what. Jay is now staying at Nick's house, which makes Nick jealous as he worries that maybe his family likes Jay more than him. Andrew's trying to send a dick pic to his cousin. Sorry, I'm not good with story. I I'm more of a joke guy. Don't have to tell me twice. More than any other season, this one definitely feels like they were doing these kinds of plots for the sake of stirring up controversy. Although, ironically enough, what I remember folks being mad about when this came out was the new character in class who talks to everyone about how she's pansexual and starts explaining what it means to all the normies, which is an actual word used. And not to make all you normie shit your old navy undies, but I am pansexual. Holy sh**! I will say, however, by the last four or so it starts to pick up again. Coincidentally, those four episodes feel like they directly build off the end of season two. There are some good ideas in here that they exaggerate to a degree that adds to the message they're trying to give without going into the territory of being too outlandish. Such as one where the boys make a list of all the girls in their grade, and in response all the girls make one of the boys. Creating all this social drama with people being upset or egotistical about their rankings, to the point where an app is made to keep track of it all. I thought that was a pretty solid concept that takes a situation teens may find themselves in and pushes it for the sake of comedy. The Depression Kitty even comes back around this point. They probably realized how they squandered such a concept, and so aimed to try and actually tackle it with the stress and pressure created by the school's exams, causing Jesse to once again feel like there's no point in anything. How do they solve it this time? Uh, her dad suggests that in the morning she should cycle to school to get her outside and also to exercise. Hey, it's an improvement! Hold the phone, is that f***ing Fortnite? During that episode, all the kids start taking Adderall to help them focus on their exams, which causes their pupils to dilate, which only proves to me how much better these characters look without the creepy gem eyes. Woohoo! Tests rule! I'm like young Sheldon! They then end the season with another pair of episodes that aren't too bad. One where Nick and Missy start to grow feelings for each other and kiss in front of Andrew, and then Nick goes on to say he doesn't even like her, causing Andrew in the finale to blow up at Nick and yells at him for never really being all that great of a friend. Which is true, again, there's rarely been any sign in this show of these guys actually hanging around each other, so to do something with that got me intrigued. It's too bad this is overshadowed by the strange what-if aspect where all the kids now have superpowers, don't question it. But they end on a good cliffhanger. Nick is now going off to camp for the summer all by himself, which is what the entire next season will focus on, I think? He and Andrew no longer like each other, Jesse is moving, and Missy gets a new hormone monster who encourages her to abandon all of her old friends. I wish the rest of the season were as focused as these last four, because the other seven are f boring. Other than that, there are two characters that I've failed to mention so far in the series. That's Coach Steve and Matthew. 
Coach Steve is awful and not funny. His only joke is that Nick Kroll likes to do a funny voice and says random dumb things, and in the first season he's the prime character they turn to when they want to make stupid meta humor. At the end of season 2 he gets fired from being the coach, which had me so relieved as it meant he'd no longer be intruding on these episodes anymore. But no! If anything, it only makes him more annoying, because they desperately try to find places to insert him back in for a scene or two. Because god forbid we try to make an episode without the iconic Coach Steve and so he just shows up every now and then to derail a plot, only to get his job back in the finale. Hooray. Matt is the opposite of Coach Steve, in that I went from really hating his character to actually liking him a lot. In the first season, his character trait is that he's the gay kid, nothing more than a stereotype, which is like, which is like nothing, you know? But there's a moment in the second season where he's confronted about this, being nothing more than a gay character used to be mean and insult everyone else, to where we see how the shame wizard torments him about this, going into his insecurities of being the only outwardly gay kid in his grid, already adding some depth to him. But they build off of it super well, having him and Jesse connect and become friends, her trying to help him get with another guy they meet during the Valentine's Day episode, the rest of the season showing him trying and feeling to be sincere with the guy, having all this internal pressure which is represented by his hormone monster, which is Maurice. This isn't relevant to much, but I think it's worth pointing out when Big Mouth does something right. I don't know, I feel like in some aspects this is a very easy topic for me. Like, I could endlessly crap on this for an hour and nobody would bat an eye and applaud. Which again, is strange to me because usually I see complaints towards criticism and animation along the lines of, why are you wasting time crapping on this? People worked hard on it! Yet when it's a show that's widely heated, that argument goes out the window, I guess? But I want to make sure that I praise the series when they do something genuinely good, because otherwise, what would be constructive about this? Overall, my opinion on the show is very negative. I'd be hard-pressed to call myself a Big Mouth fan. But I could name 50 cartoons worse than this. I can definitely see why people like it, at least. General audiences love this show. There's a reason why it's got six seasons, while a lot of other Netflix cartoons only get one or two. It casts its net very wide. Like, puberty is something everyone goes through. So its target demographic is much larger than a lot of other stuff in the service. This may seem unrelated, but I think it's worth mentioning. I don't like Big Mouth, but I can 100% understand why people do. I went out of my way to reach out to some folks who genuinely enjoy it, and I kept hearing the same thing. That it is willing to go into all these taboo subjects that other shows avoid. That it does force you to sit and look the gross parts of growing up, and I can see how that would make teenagers watching it maybe feel less alone, but... Again, though, I don't really need to see a lot of this stuff. Big Mouth Season 3 is probably in between 1 and 2, in my opinion. 2 is alright and 1 is pretty bad the whole way through, and while a large chunk of Season 3 is like 1 in that regard, those last few episodes reminded me of the best of 2, and I can only hope now that they're aiming to have the next season entirely focus on one setting with a set of characters, that it causes things to be even more focused on the character dynamics. Let's see. Ah, uh, who is watching this garbage? The neo trolls on YouTube are right. This show is disgusting. You know oh, who had a good intro song? This guy stinks. I know. I mean, the main characters are kids, but the show is so filthy. It's too much. I am extremely happy to say that season four of Big Mouth might just be their best yet. It didn't go in the direction I was expecting, and I know being the best season of Big Mouth isn't exactly high praise, as in reality, it's just okay. But credit where credit's due. I didn't think this one was all that bad, even if it does fall into a lot of the same traps as the previous seasons. Didn't need an entire episode about masturbation. Initially, I figured this entire thing would take place during a summer camp, but no. Only the first three episodes are, with the rest taking place back in their regular school. With them not even really doing all that much here that relates to camp, it really is just a change of background scenery, as an excuse to have Nick and Andrew rekindle their friendship. Ba -ba -boo I liked this whole thing, though. Andrew getting the upper hand for once and befriending all of Nick's camp buddies like Seth Rogen child, and they even introduce a trans character, and I think they tackle that stuff pretty well. But this stuff is all but forgotten after summer ends and they all go back to school to see how everyone has changed over the past few months. Jay and Lola are now dating, and Missy is acting completely different. See, you can tell because she has a new haircut. And some new creatures have followed them home. The Anxiety Mosquitoes. Yeah, so this is a season all about the subject of anxieties and the different ways they can take form. A move which I'm glad they took was once again it allows them to keep building off this concept the whole way through. Everyone's anxiety getting the better of them before ultimately in the end managing to overcome it. After a whole bunch of nothing and making yet another episode about him wanting to get with his cousin that ends with him jacking off to the corpse of his grandfather, Andrew out of nowhere starts to worry about death, overcome with dread at the fact that it lurks around every corner and that he really has no control over it. Missy is struggling with her image after she starts to get more in touch with her own culture after feeling like her family were trying to suppress it. Can you guess how they tackle this progressive subject? With a Black Panther parody, obviously. 
It feels like... It feels like Wakanda. Speaking... Speaking of progressive, during this season, Missy's voice actress changes after her previous VA and Nick Kroll decided that it wasn't cool for a white lady to be voicing a black character. That's well and good, but I find it funny because not once, but twice in this season, do they make jokes acknowledging that very fact. Had no problem joking about it multiple times. Ugh. My mom's white, my dad's black, I'm voiced by a white actress who's 37 years old. <laughs> Isn't it funny this white woman voices a black character? She can't say the n-word because IRL, she's white. Okay, but guys, seriously though, we care deeply about fair representation. Yes, you can. I promise you, it is not okay for me to say that word. It took a bit of getting used to, but honestly, I think I prefer the new voice. It's well less whiny and high-pitched. They yet again revisit the stuff with Jessie being depressed, now having moved and attending this fancy private school where she doesn't fit in, opting to start skipping class to hang out with her new boyfriend. It's kinda it for the most part until the ending. Nick definitely gets the most attention, which makes sense, especially considering that so far I'm not all that sure about why I'm supposed to like him as our protagonist, because he's been nothing but an asshole for a majority of the show. But here we get to see more of his insecurities start to shine through and overcome him, due to the anxiety mosquitoes. We see that his biggest fear is dying alone, feeling like nobody will ever love him, which is sad. They show how he actually has feelings for Jesse that comes out of nowhere, they have not even implied anything with them since like the start of season 1. But because of this, seeing her with her new boyfriend ignites these emotions from him, which is followed up in possibly the strangest episode in the entire series at this point. So, out of nowhere, we suddenly see the life of future Nick where he's a big shot comedian. I sure do love when creators insert themselves into their own shows and make themselves celebrities. The guy even calls himself Nick Star. But we see that the world is all desolate and on the brink of destruction, to where Nick has to return to his hometown to attend the funeral of his friend Miss- wait a minute. That's the same exact plot as the South Park Future Special, and, and this one came out first, what the hell? He goes back so he can confess his love to Jesse so they can escape the earth together before it blows up, in which they do and are about to frick each other. Also, I like how they show restraint in showing adult Jesse's private parts but not kid Jesse, whoa. Well, oh. But then she reveals it was all a trick, she blows everyone up, and Nick realizes that he truly is all alone in the world. Oh yeah, and it was all in his imagination. Love it. This episode honestly isn't very good, way too much of it is just showing us what the future looks like instead of telling an actual story, like, Jesse isn't even introduced until the last 10 minutes, but just remember this stuff, it comes back later, I promise. After this, there's a Halloween special, which I genuinely think may be the best episode in the entire series. It is genuinely... kind of alright. Showing all the kids enter a haunted house where they're drugged and experience their own personal living hells, where they then have to overcome what's causing them all this stress and anxiety. Andrew learns that there's nothing he can do to stop his eventual death, so there's no use in stressing about it. Missy learns that she doesn't have to act one single way, and that she's made up of all different and varied sides to herself. Matthew, oh yeah, his mother learned that he was gay earlier on, realizes that it's not the end of the world now that she knows, and that ultimately everything will be fine. And Jesse learns that while she can't stop the negative stuff going on in her life, she can at the very least have gratitude for the little things that she may take for granted in her every day, seeing that there's a lot to appreciate about her life. They all have a nice little arc. Everyone but Nick, who learns the message of always protecting himself and never putting himself out there so he'll never get hurt. His future self even returns by the end to ensure him that by choosing this option he'll be cementing being alone for the rest of his life. This is the best episode, but I couldn't even recommend checking it out, because it relies so much on the build-up of the previous stuff, which is pretty hit or miss. Like the one from two episodes ago, where it's just four random stories of the characters all jerking off, you know, it's not, it's not that amusing. But the finale builds off this one, although possibly in the worst way it could have. Because Nick wakes up to see that he's now a lost soul, his body having been possessed by... Future Nick. Okay, why is he doing this? How did Future Nick travel back in time to get here? So did he really meet his future self in the Halloween episode, or was it from the drugs? Never said! The whole point is to show everyone trying to act on what they learned in the last episode, only for future Nick to come around and undo that progress, where Ghost Nick then has to try and uplift his friends again. It's a little too fantastical for my tastes. Like, it does a thing similar to the end of Season 2 where their solutions to this stuff is too simple. Like, Jessie sees that helping Nick makes her less depressed, which I'm pretty sure is the exact wording she chooses, but like, it would distract her from it, sure, but not make it shrink. There's a lot of moments in this show where they treat these emotions super simply, and I'm beginning to accept that that's all they'll really do with them. Which wouldn't be bad if they weren't treating this like it's the most grind-breaking advice ever. Hey guys, here's some helpful tips to being less depressed. Number one, exercise. Number Stop two, pick on your friends' problems too. Number three, 
I like the moment at the end where Nick goes inside his own body and has to face the embodiment of his own anxieties, learning to accept and embrace them as a part of him, overall ending the season on a fine note. Like I said, this was probably their best season yet. I enjoy aspects of two more, but it has stuff like the awful abortion episode and stuff, so I definitely feel four is more consistently alright. I have no idea where they can go from here though. Like, Nick is not in love with Jesse, but all the other characters feel as if they're getting to a point where there's not much to do with them. You know, this is the third season in a row where Jesse has learned to deal with her own depression, so let's see where they take us in season 5. Season 5 of Big Mouth is all about love, with Jesse and Nick both getting a love bug. However, despite this being because Nick wants to get with Jesse, she, on the other hand, wants to get with the new girl from last season, Allie. You can, uh, you can see the conflict of interest here. I understand why they do this formula of introducing a new creature every season, so they're not bombarding you with all these guys at once. Also, because I don't think they ever thought that far ahead. But it just leaves me asking more questions. Like, wasn't Andrew madly in love with Missy during season 1 and 2, yet he never got a love bug? But the second Nick starts liking Jesse, it shows up for him? Boy, I sure hope somebody got fired for that blunder. Nick Kroll. The main issue I have with this season is how it lacks any kind of direction until the ending. They bring back a bunch of old stuff like continuing Jan Lola's war from the last season after they break up. The Sheem Wizard comes back to star in his own episode again. It really feels like they've begun running out of steam if that was even possible. Despite only being at season 5, it's already starting to reach that point where their characters are turning into one-note archetypes. Especially Andrew, he's the worst culprit to this. In the beginning he was an awkward and perverted kid, yeah, but there was still a part of him that felt real in a way. But after the second season they really started leaning into that perversion. To the point where it just feels like they took Jay's character from early on and replaced it with Andrew because now Jay has bisexual adventures to go on. Honestly, it may just be a case of getting in new writers and such as the show has went on. I actually checked out the writers and stuff and was shocked to see that Nick Kroll was only responsible for writing one episode of Big Marv, that being the pilot. And while other producers such as Andrew Goldberg have been a little more involved throughout the show, it seems like season 5 and 6 are the ones with the least amount of involvement from its original creators. And while there's not a noticeable drop in quality or anything, it definitely does feel... different. Like a lot of them, though, it does begin to pick up by the last few episodes. Over time, we're also introduced to another new creature, the Heat Worm, which Missy gets after becoming jealous over Jesse and Allie stealing her idea or something, I don't know, which causes her to go online and epically troll them all. Nick then also gets one after Jesse breaks his heart in front of the whole class, his love bug dying and coming back as a worm, Missy and Nick both bonding over their mutual hatred of them both, which turns their worms into heat snakes, growing larger and larger. This is the main theme of the season, but it is way less grand compared to what each previous one had built up. These ones remain episodic for the most part despite a couple of running themes, like Matthew breaking up with his boyfriend to pursue Jay because he likes him now, I guess? Yeah, that's natural. There's also this big half-hour long Christmas special where they tell a bunch of random Christmas stories using the Big Mouth characters, and I'm gonna be real with you, I skimmed through this one. There are not words to describe how much I hate when a show does these types of episodes. They are so bloody boring to me and I don't know why. I think it might come from my love of The Simpsons. As a kid, they would air around four Simpsons episodes every night, and so when one of them was a goddamn anthology I had already seen five times before, seven-year-old me was furious. Anyway, Big Mouth. I will say, however, there is some stuff to appreciate about it, like all the different art styles they go for, which are replicated pretty well, like a more action-y looking style, stop motion, and a storybook aesthetic. I think it's important to recognize that when a show has a generally ugly art style, I see a lot of folks trying to say that the artists and animators working on it are lazy or untalented, when that's not the case at all. They just do what they're told. And there were a few moments in Big Mouth where I could truly see that talent shine through. You know, all this stuff. The puppets they use for in between the stories also look great. There's plenty to love here, but I just can't get with a bunch of random inconsequential stories. It ain't my thing. You know what definitely ain't my thing? The finale. So, by the end of the season, Nick realizes that he is like like bad or something, and accidentally gets transported back into the monster world with no way out, and so Andrew and Maurice have got to go and find him. This is then followed up by Nick having to go and talk to the head of human resources, which is Nick Kroll standing on a green screen, and it becomes painfully obvious that this guy freaking loves himself. You're using me and this whole show to work through your own 
from when you were a kid? Well, mine and all the other writers, but yeah, mostly mine. He basically just stands there explaining the entire plot of the show to Nick. Him realizing that he's just a cartoon character that's used to vent about stuff that happened to Mr. Crow as a kid. And they make a bunch of jokes like, Yeah, I do this and then, look, we're even writing the episode right now. But I don't think the guy did a single thing in this season other than voice the characters and stand here like a goober. I can see why this is funny in a meta way, but it comes off as super lame to me. This joke works in random comedies like Uncle Grandpa or Chowder. Well, Uncle G, did you find out the meaning of your life? Yeah, some bulk guy drew me when he was bored. But for Big Mouth, where the entire gimmick of the series is kids learning how to deal with how rapidly things change during puberty, to have smug-ass Nick Kroll stand there and basically give Nick the advice he needs comes off super lazy and basic. But alas, it works. Nick learns to stop drinking that heater aid, and his heat sneak turns back into a love bug. Hooray. Hold on, you voice me? Yeah. Oh, bummer. I thought I was Will Arnett. Well, maybe people think that I'm Bojack. No, nobody thinks that. Yeah, I know. Jesse also realizes to not be such a dick and apologizes to Missy, which too turns her heat into love, ending the season on a nice little note. Season 5 definitely feels like the turning point for Big Marth. Season 4 already felt as if it could have been the finale to the series. It even ended on all the monsters singing about the themes of the show, so who knows, maybe they initially thought that would be the end of the show, before getting picked up again. But all the characters really seemed like they had reached a natural conclusion to their arcs, and from this point on it's like they don't know what to do with them anymore, so they keep adding in more and more monsters hoping it creates more conflict. Still though, it was fine. There wasn't really any glaring issues with it. Although maybe at this point I'm just becoming numb to all the bad stuff and I'm just looking for any glimmer of hope I can deem from it. But even then, Season 5 is without a doubt the least memorable. Next up is the most recent season, number 6. After this, we're finally done. But I'm mostly curious, before we end, are they gonna get the series back on track or continue to derail from what the show started as? Why? Because it's Big Mouth! These people are sick! Here we go, the final season of Big Mouth. May just be the worst yet. I think there are other seasons of Big Mouth that have much worse episodes, but 6 overall just has the least amount of interesting ones. It is such a boring season. That also might have to do with me running out of steam while viewing these. It's been a week of non-stop Big Mouth. It has not been fun, I'll tell you that much. There is no real theme for this one. It's bizarre how they keep switching back and forth on that. But Nick meets his Scottish grandfather who eventually moves into their house to his mother's dismay. Missy likes this new boy who turns out to be asexual. She has literally nothing to do with the main cast anymore. And so basically that's why my voice sounds a little different now. Oh, it sounds like eventually they made the right choice. Hey, Matthew needs to break up with Jazz. He's become too nice. And Andrew's parents have been increasingly fighting more and more. Oh yeah, also, don't question why Maurice is pregnant sometimes in these clips, and then who this little smaller hormone monster is. Apparently in the Human Resources spin-off, Maury and Connie are gonna have a baby together, which I guess then transfers into Big Mouth. Although it's bizarre to me how this is structured, as it starts by establishing how Connie doesn't want the kid, but then a few episodes in she suddenly does want it. So if you're watching Human Resources and want to follow along with the storylines, I guess that requires you to also check out Big Mouth. A while back I decided to watch some of Human Resources when it came out, just to see if it were anywhere near as bad, and was surprised to see that I actually enjoyed it way more than Big Mouth, which a lot of people seem to agree with. I only saw the first episode and while nothing amazing, I think a series focusing on these guys dealing with characters that aren't restricted to only children allows for a great variety of storytelling. It had this elderly lady with dementia plot in the first one which I actually really liked. So, if you want to look at any of this after watching the video, I'd probably recommend the first episode of Human Resources. I can't speak for the rest. I really don't like how they handle Andrew and his new girlfriend. I never enjoyed it when a show would bring in a long-term relationship that doesn't reset for one of the characters, and then a couple episodes later has them acting completely differently just for the sake of breaking them up again. Like, why even bother at that point? There are also two really awful episodes here that I wasn't a fan of. They do the same thing as Season 4 where we see four different characters going through a similar situation. This time, it's all about the girls private parts. Is that okay for me to say, YouTube? I have no idea anymore. They have so many close-up shots of Jessie violently scrubbing her thing, and we see it get bright red and itchy with yeast pouring out of it, like really redded eating during that episode. Then there's like a musical episode. I think it's a Mamma Mia parody, but it's Lola getting three dads all at once, and I'm glad to see that even six seasons in, she can remain the most consistently annoying character in the whole show. Nothing, though, could have prepared me for the finale, where out of nowhere, all the characters wake up in different bodies. I don't know either. 
I don't know, man. I never understand these people from the house. They always want to do something kooky, and I don't get it. Jesse is switched with her dad's new baby, Missy with some random actor she likes, Nick with his grandfather, and Andrew with his dad. Why they insist on inserting these random-ass supernatural elements to this show is beyond me, but it is a pretty terrible way to end the season. Basically, they're just able to fix whatever problem was currently facing them, because who they're switched with relates to it. Problem solved. Andrew's parents have made up, Nick's dad is back to being nice, Jesse learns to accept her new sister, and Missy learns that it's okay for a new boyfriend is asexual. Hooray for all. And that's Big Mouth. I really wish I had more to say about these past couple seasons, I realize now that I spent like 20 minutes talking about the first and 5 for the last, but I think that only goes to show how much the series feels like it's just out of energy. It feels drained, like there's no more grind to cover. Recounting back to season 1 honestly made it sound kinda quaint, when it was just these 5 characters going through their regular lives with a monster following them around. Now we follow like 20 characters and their additional 40 monsters, who rarely ever even speak to each other anymore, as they learn the same messages over and over again. It at least seems that season 6 hasn't left on a cliffhanger, which they usually do, which I hope means that with the next one, they aim to start fresh and get back to basics in a way. Scale back and focus on what... Okay, well I was gonna say focus on what made it good, but that's not entirely true, is it? I guess I just don't like this show on a fundamental level. Such a contrarian, I know. But what pains me most is that I really, really love the idea behind Big Mouth. Exploring everything that comes with growing up in a non-episodic format, where characters can grow and change over time that isn't reset every 22 minutes. Where it falters is the lack of restraint shown by the writers who clearly had a background in writing for Family Guy. There is merit to that sort of style, and again, I can completely understand why some folks like that very aspect of it, but it just doesn't do it for me. If Big Mouth had a better art style, stayed more grinded, and maybe censored some more of those uncomfortable scenes, I probably wouldn't think it was all that bad. But it all comes together to create a series that feels like it never really knows exactly what it's trying to be, and I think that's what holds it back the most. However, it's got a seventh season coming, and unless Netflix goes under, it isn't getting cancelled anytime soon. At this point, I have accepted our Big Marth Overlords, and I think you all need to as well. I'm tired of seeing it be brought up every other day, people taking any cartoon being cancelled as an excuse to crap on it, saying it should also be cancelled, when I promise you, Big Marth is not taking the spot of another cartoon. It is now up there with Simpsons, Family Guy, and South Park as a series that'll never die. And the sooner we all accept that, the sooner we can move on from it.